is not just mine, his or her house. This is our house. Hello everyone, my name is Tyrone Lowe. This is my show, The Legends. I want to thank everybody that actually subscribes to my show and show me love all over the world. In the house of The Legends, um, this person that I'm actually going to introduce you to has a lot of hats. Um, he's a DJ, he's an author, he's a producer, and he's a personal friend of mine. In the house of The Legends, I give you DJ Disciples. What's going on, dude? How are you, Tyrone? Thank you well, so much for having me on your show. Thank you for being here, man. Yes. So. In case you don't know this guy, we're going to talk about a little bit of his past, and, and we're going to bring you up to speed. So let's talk about how you actually got into music, man. I was born in it. Um, okay. I lived in the same building as Grandmaster Flowers. Um, across the street lived Kenny Carpenter, who okay. knew me when I was born, mm -hmm. and Strafe as well. I used to come to the house. Right. He's the man that made Set It Off. Right. My brother Larry Banks um, played for the Church of the Open Door, and okay. my brother Stanley Banks plays played for uh, George Benson and been playing for George Benson for 40 wow, years. That's My amazing. dad, um, William Banks, uh, he also played piano and jammed with Miles Davis. Right. So I was born into the music. Mm -hmm. um, I have pictures of myself when I was two years old having my head around the turntable as the turntable was moving. Oh, wow. I would swirl my head around. And this was back in 1965, 66. Okay, okay. So ever since I was a baby, I was born into this music. Um, from the early soul. Um, my mother was an avid lover of WBLS okay. um, when it was called WBLIB. Mm -hmm. And so we were always into different musical movements at that time. Mm -hmm. And so I was born into music and I had a lot of family musicians come through. Um, as I said before, Grandmaster Flowers lived in my building, mm -hmm. but his, younger, his, 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 his brother was Tyrone Flowers and okay. he would come in and do covers with my brother Larry, because oh, okay. my brother Larry also played bass. So the Flowers family and my family were really, really, really good friends. Mm -hmm. Whereas when Flowers and Dice, when he was doing a lot of graffiti, Stanley at that time was playing football with Flowers right. at a certain point as they were coming up in Farragut. Mm -hmm. Farragut Housing had great, great um, artists throughout the post-disco era. Okay. Um, Rusty Taylor played the bass uh, for Shannon. Okay. And obviously, you know, you had uh, James Missouri, who played at the Church of the Open Door initially in the 60s, who was down with the East Harlem Gospel Choir, okay. which was a gospel funk group right. that was played by DJs like Nicky, Nicky Ciano at the gallery. Mm -hmm. So Farragut has always been a, sp a special place for music. Mm -hmm. um, when the Navy Yard closed down, you had a variety of different places. Right. Um, that, 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 that catered to people, but when that shut down, a lot of faith-based communities came up. Right. Um, Jim Hill was a pastor, a motivational pastor mm -hmm. for um, a place at St. Ives. He was a motivational speaker okay. that did free breakfast for the kids. Mm -hmm. um, you had other people like um, Janet McDonald, who wrote the book uh, that got, became popular on Oprah Winfrey, mm -hmm. but she came from Dr. White Community Center, um, and we all came up there with doing the Riversiders and Streamliners. So our family history, as far as music is concerned, mm -hmm. has been very intimate and very strong. And, that, and that's kind of cool because um, you've been around for a while and you've traveled some places as well. And so when did you actually say to yourself one day, I'm really going to take this to a whole different level in my life and make it a passion? Well, I was a gospel um, drummer mm -hmm. at the Ref Greater Refuge Temple. Okay. So I started off playing drums in church, and I've discovered um, music through Ralph Davis. Ralph Davis will always be part of my story because he helped me and he introduced me to radio. Mm -hmm. And from that point, I started doing gospel music. I was writing for it at the t as, a, as a writer for the ticker. Okay. So when I got into college, you could say, I've really started my journey in, into just journalizing the music as well as playing the music. Mm -hmm. And then DJ Jazz taught me about house music. He introduced me to what house music is. Right. 
and Rock and Rich taught me how to mix. Rock and Rich works for WBLS now. Oh, okay, okay. But he taught me how to mix. Mm -hmm. So all of these elements really wanted me to help me to take it to another level. When I started working at WNYE 91.5 FM mm -hmm. in 1988, that's when I really knew that I had the biggest platform that any DJ could have doing radio all around New York City. Mm -hmm. And I was able to utilize that platform for the hunger musically for DJs here in New York and abroad, mm -hmm. working uh, with UK pioneers like a guy named Gerald, um, who made the song Voodoo Ray, which was a popular song back in 88. Exactly, Richie yeah, Rich that mm -hmm. did Salsa House and Baby Four. These are all Acid House producers. Right. I was into regular house and Acid House movements, mm -hmm. um, learning under the toolage of just going out and hearing DJs like Johnny Dinell and Roman Ricardo, mm -hmm. um, both who had played at the Palladium and the Tunnel. Mm -hmm. So I kind of came in on the back end of house music explosions that right. was happening after the Paradise Garage closed, mm -hmm. and then knowing that the college kids that went to the garage were the kids that I started playing for. So I had to understand what the Paradise Garage was mm -hmm. and who Larry LeVan was. And at that time, Larry LeVan was like God to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. He was like, oh my God, this person is an amazing DJ. Yeah. And mm -hmm. when I went to Studio 54 at the behest of a college promoter named Monty Collins, mm -hmm. he said, listen, man, in order for you to be down with Phi Beta Sigma and doing college parties with us, you got to play like that guy. And that guy <laughs> was Larry LeVan. I hear that. And so mm -hmm. I had to learn what he was able to do in, in, in relearning what the Paradise Garage Classics was, what were the differences between what happened between there and the loft, mm -hmm. what happened between the loft and the gallery, what happened between the, the, all those musical movements that ho helped enrich the radio show. Mm -hmm. And so my mother had a say in, hey, you gotta put women on the radio. You would need to interview different kind of people on mm -hmm. your radio show. Mm -hmm. So f since 88, I had been interviewing house music artists mm -hmm. and documenting their movements. Right. And so with the popularity of that radio show and because I was catering so much to British artists, my radio show started becoming popular in the UK where they were selling tapes of my shows. Wow. And this is how I was able to, mm -hmm. so, so being able to sell the tapes mm -hmm. and becoming popular in England because of it, the demand grew for me to go inevitably go over there. But before that happened, mm -hmm. there were some other musical movements that I, I bring out, okay. which is part of why this book is here today in front okay. of you. Before we get into the book, let's talk about you per se to the point where some of the places that you've actually played at. Okay. Let's talk about that. Well, in here, here in New York, mm -hmm. I was very, very fortunate because after the Paradise Garage closed, um, the first club I played at was Studio 54. Okay. Okay. Once I was able to be successful at Studio 54, I was doing Phi Beta Sigma events right. where I would close shows for Run DMC and Joe Manda and um, a lot of the hip-hop artists mm -hmm. because house music and hip-hop kind of fuse with the same audience. Right. But the, promote, the, the Phi Beta Sigmas knew that it was cheaper to get Liz Torres as opposed to some of the bigger acts, that hip-hop mm -hmm. acts that they had had. Mm -hmm. So doing the college circuit was a great way to springboard me for awareness, coupled with the radio show, to get the attention of the Wild Pitch Parties, which mm -hmm. was with Greg Day, DJ Camacho, Nick Jones, Bobby Condis. And this nucleus of a collaboration between New York DJs and New Jersey DJs that were collective in bringing this music together right. and making it completely underground. Richard Vasquez is a person that went to the same church that I went to, which was the Greater Refuge Temple. Oh, okay, okay. And so that helped the f with, with the fact that I was so much into trying to pursue the knowledge of understanding classics that came from the garage. Mm -hmm. He offered me the, the opportunity to alternate with Larry LeVan at The Choice, which was on 3rd Street and Avenue A in, a, in a, on the lower side of Manhattan. Right. And so by playing at The Choice, I was able to alternate with him and then Basil. Frankie Knuckles played at the same location, mm -hmm. as did Dave Morales, and as of uh, Victor Rosado. So a lot of the collective of DJs, I had to learn, sit and learn from those guys. DJ Camacho as well. Right. So from that, mm -hmm. um, inevitably, there was an opening in Jersey. 
And the first place I played at was Club 280, okay. which is where Hippie, uh, Hippie Torales and Deuce Martinez were also residents. I shared nights with DJ Camacho there, right. um, and we started getting the Zans of our crowd. Mm -hmm. So much so that, that when Tony Humphreys left, I started playing at Zanzibar. Okay. So I, from the Zanzibar scene, I was able to connect with Jazzy B and Naeem Johnson. Naeem Johnson was that culture bearer that became popular in Jersey after Tony Humphreys left. Right. So from those musical movements, um, I get introduced, obviously, knowing who Roger Sanchez is. Mm -hmm. And Roger Sanchez exposes me to the West Coast rave scene which is started with Toontown and so forth. Mm -hmm. Those musical movements help shape, shape me into the musical diversity as a DJ. Until 1992, at the end, um, November, December, I start going to Lakota and Bristol, and I start touring in the UK. Mm -hmm. I start playing at Ministry of Sound. I, may, I start understanding what feel real is and understanding where a lot of the musical movements. So I a lot of my records started becoming big. I started producing records here in the Bronx with Bobby Davis from Shore Record right. Pool. And, and, so, and I'm still and so, sure. <laughs> right. I'm still and so, sure. so by, right. by producing those records right. from Shore Record Pool, mm -hmm. uh, Bobby gives me that platform. Right, right. And I start working with Eddie Perez from Smack Productions. Mm -hmm. And that was important for me to prof profile one important person that I think needed help to bring their sound out. Mm. That person's name was Todd Edwards. Okay. And I was trying to break his name. I asked Roger to remix a song, any song from his catalog, and he did As I Am. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was known for breaking unreleased material. Um, Camacho and I had broken records like Follow Me. We were the first one to break it. I think that Camacho was responsible also for getting that record signed to Strictly Rhythm. But also, mm -hmm. when I went to the UK, I was the first one playing Deep Inside by Barbara Tucker. Okay. Um, so we were breaking in records, and I was known as an acetate person that kind of collaborated with the UK DJs out there like Paul Trouble Anderson um, and Femi B. A lot of us were breaking acetates and breaking the musical movements. Right. And so um, inevitably, we're working with Smack. I had gotten a record on the dance floor that I did with Lemuel Blackwell that was part of Grassroots Records. Mm -hmm. That record wound up going number 67 in the charts. Wow. So at this time, I'm also documenting for Street Sound Magazine. So not only am I playing in the, in the clubs and I'm writing the, 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 the music and I'm doing radio, mm -hmm. that overseas work that I start doing in collaboration goes a full gear further. Um, and this is all like something that springboards out of the mindset of A, being humble, right? Mm -hmm. Being able to have a collaborative spirit. Right. And knowing the power of delegation to know that you don't have to do everything yourself, but if you give as much power as the next person that you have and you all come up together, then you can all grow together. That's true. You know, unifica unification process is a very important part of any culture, actually. Yes. You know, um, I, I think we need a little bit more of that because um, from the beginning to now, as far as Indy's concerned, um, the game has changed a little bit as far as attitude. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's not like the vibes is not like what we had like in the 70s and the 80s where we were more into unification. There wasn't nobody trying to cut nobody's throats, things of that nature. Um, right. You know, um, it was, the vibes were just different. But in the meantime, we're going to take a little break, and we'll be right back with my boy, DJ Disciples, and we're going to get into this here book, okay? So um, stay tuned. We'll be right back. It's not just mine, his or her house. This is our house. My assignment, my calling is to inspire, uplift. You have to make sure your people are partying. All I want to do is just bring joy to the dance floor and watch people dance. See, no, see, no, see, no, see, no, see.
Dynamic soul sounds of DJ Tyro. And we're back. My name is Tyrone Lowe. This is my show, The Legends. And in the house of the legends, I have DJ Disciples. So what we're going to talk about is uh, he has a brand new book out and um, he has a book signing coming up, too. But we're going to talk about, all that, about that. So DJ Disciples, let's talk about the book, the beat, the scene, the sound. Yes. It's uh, the behind the scenes account of um, new house music in New York City from the 18, 1980s up until the EDM mm -hmm. um, storylines. And the reason why this book was written was because there's a lot of stories that's been not told. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that are in this book are no longer alive. Right. Some have passed on, some have had some struggles. Mm -hmm. And um, this is talking about DJing from a social justice aspect mm -hmm. because we're talking about DJing through the crack ep ep epidemic, right. the AIDS epidemic, and the broken windows policy where Giuliani um, demonized nightclubs, shut it down, right. and then DJs had to travel abroad mm -hmm. to mo make most of their money. And from that, in my journey, mm -hmm. we talk about all the musical movements. This would not been really possible without the um, help of my co-writer, Henry Cronk. Mm -hmm. um, I approached him in 2018 with a bunch of stories that I've documented. Right. And we worked together to f formulate an impulsive, powerful story that talks about nightlife, about um, different genres mm -hmm. of house music, right. and about different musical movements dealing with different levels of what DJs have to navigate through. Right. Why it's important for them to have managers and agents, how they can go through a mental depression, mm -hmm. how they can lose faith, um, how house music has changed right. um, from the vinyl we were playing back in the days mm -hmm. into the, the music that can be sometimes disposable in an MP3 format. Mm -hmm. And then dealing with record store culture, dealing with um, different levels of producing and studio hardware that we used back then till now. Right. Um, it's one thing you didn't mention was record pools. Oh, it's in there though. Oh, okay. That's yeah. what's up. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure up record pool is definitely in okay. there mm -hmm. because obviously Bobby Davis yes. I met from the New Underground Network. Mm -hmm. And so um, his influence and impact on my life is right. important. So that's definitely mentioned in the book. You know, it's just one day you just woke up and said, I'm just going to just go ahead and symbolize the legacy of this thing called music. And you said to yourself, well, I just want to just go ahead and just express myself out there and, and uh, collect all this information and make it very you know, accessible to people out there. And so how did you actually come about it, you know? Well, I mean, I think it's important for people to know who David Camacho is. But right. Nobody knows who Paul Trouble Anderson is. Mm -hmm. But let's put the DJs to the side. Okay. Let's just talk about some of the dancers that are in, in right, the Right, okay. Like Voodoo Ray, mm -hmm. or like E. Joe Wilson, or Marjorie Smart. These are dancers that have made a name for themselves right. overseas. Mm -hmm. Or a Dawn Tormund who was the queen of gospel energy. Right, right. Uh, the importance of, you know, Barbara Tucker and Don Welch as promoters. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of women in our scene. There are a lot of different scenes that I talk about that are important and relevant right. from every kind of scene that I can think of. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about Francis Grosso and how he was also one of the pioneers that help mix records together. Right. Obviously, we talk about Grandmaster Flowers, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of legacies tied into the book right. to make sure that people know that this is coming from an inclusive mindset. Right. It's exactly. my journey, yeah. but there are a lot of people and scenes, dancers, singers that are involved. Obviously, we can do another volume to enhance it. I think you should. But I think, I think that this will be a way for people to understand that within every DJ mm -hmm. or promoter, there's a story. Right. I didn't. When I go to libraries and I go to bookstores, I don't see house music on the table. And so we've been published by Roman Littlefield, okay. which we've been very fortunate. They're one of the biggest publishers in America. Mm -hmm. And Louis Vega has done our forward. 
We've had the support of Roger Sanchez, mm -hmm. of Armin Van Helden, Robert Owens, um, that helped us, you know, navigate through this as well right. as Josh Milan. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of the house music community behind us, mm -hmm. but it is written for the intention for the people that are passionate about this music right. and want to see what the culture is all about. So you know, we recognize mm -hmm. DJs like Remarka, Risa Garcia, mm -hmm. um, promoters like Becky Nunez, um, that are still, as a woman, That's still so making it. Yeah, yeah that is like Mickey Affleck mm -hmm. that, are, that is doing producing in our, our own right. right. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of musical movements that we talk about, but we want to make sure that we give everybody their flowers. Right. You know, and that's very important that, because uh, everybody doesn't do that. Yeah. Nobody has that collective thought of saying that one day I'm going to pay homage to a lot of people that actually came into the house music scene that are not with us and, and, and people that are still with us. Yes. I think that's very important. So my question to you, what is house music to you, man, personally? La house music is a language spoken, understood by all, mm -hmm. but not everybody understands house music okay. because it's a spiritual thing, it's a body thing, right. it's a soul thing. And so what does house music mean to you? It can be so the lyrics of something that saves your life. Right. It can be something that touches you and that you never can forget about. So we know that house music can heal. We know that house music is a, a unified. It takes away the stigma of what people might think of in an LGBTQ community. Right. Because you can be whatever sexual orientation you want to be in house music, and you could still be aligned with that person and tell that person, I love you. Mm -hmm. Or I can talk to a dancer that may not, you know, they might come from a poor economic class, mm -hmm. or anybody that comes from a poor economic class. Right. It transcends all of that. That's what house music is to mm -hmm. me. It's something that transcends and that's a healer. And the, the, the beautiful thing about house music to me is that so many people that come from the church right. also connect with house music from they the do. very beginning. They when do. we think about Daryl Pandy, come from the church. Robert Kenny, Owens, Kenny come Bobian, from the church. Can be, can Everybody. Bobian, yeah. that, that's a lot of people collectively because we see that it is morally neutral. Mm -hmm. It really, really doesn't belittle women. It doesn't talk about negative aspects. Right. And then, even as you age older, mm -hmm. house music is there for you when you want to live longer and you want to dance your life away. You can <laughs> dance and you can burn cal calorie off and then you're with an audience right. that's also grown and within your own. You don't have to go to a club or a young person party mm -hmm. because the mobile DJ movement is back. You can go to uh, a Commodore Barry Park and pa party right. with people that's yeah. 40, 50, 60, 70, and you don't have to be, feel excluded. You could be included exactly. in our musical movement, and you don't have to stay back in the day. A lot of the DJs that's in their 40s, 50s, 60s are still pushing this music for that audience that's within their same age group right. and still being connected to the music from new artists or old artists, whatever option it is. Mm -hmm. And so for house music, it means a lot to a lot of people, right. but it is a unifier. It is, since the Woodstock movement, right. something that talks about peace, love, love and togetherness, and, yes, most and definitely, happiness. Yeah. My question to you is like, I ask everybody this on my shows because it's very important, it's very informative. You know, what do you have to say to the DJ of tomorrow that actually wants to get into the craft today you know what do they have to actually do what guidelines they really have to follow and and also the fundamentals of actually getting into the craft itself i think that when you repurpose yourself and know where you stand mm -hmm. you have to also because we in the internet age right we have to really assess where we at what mm -hmm. we need to invest ourselves in some people invest themselves as just being a promoter and they expand that network and that allows them to become a DJ because they know so many people. They go out every day right. and they connect. Some people, like the people that's in the book, mm -hmm. are dancers. They never got into it as a DJ, but be they, because they love the music so much and they were, they're connected to the DJs that's playing it, they discover that they go through the record shops or they go on mm -hmm. to digital stores and they find their own craft and create their own style. The internet has created a way where um, people can express themselves musically. Right. And so I would encourage everybody that has uh, a lane, which many do. There's a lot of DJ schools for people right, where they right. can go and learn the craft. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of online sessions where people can learn how to produce music. They can know about studio equipment. The internet has given people access for a lot of people to be DJs. Right, and right. I don't frown on any scene. Mm -hmm. I think that any scene could be purposefully used to help 
um, enable anybody to become stronger because house music, house music has become that gateway where everybody can, even if it's within their own bu bubble, they can find a level of creativity and expression. Living in New York City, mm -hmm. where rent is $3,000 a month, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't get the ability to live out their dreams. Right. They have to have a dr job, or they have to have a side, or do that on the side. Yeah. And so that's also what we struggle with in this book, mm -hmm. is because you every time you want to choose DJing as a career, you got to kind of roll the dice. Yeah. And you got to navigate what's yeah. important and what's it for, for priorities. When I, when I had my daughter, when my daughter was born, I stopped touring the world because I did everything I needed to do at that time. Mm -hmm. There's a time and place for everything. And sometimes you have to do what you need to do in order for you to do what you want to do. And so sometimes later in life, you might have been a corrections officer or you might have been that fire department person and you always had DJ in your love. But now that you, you retired in your pension, now you want to get back into it. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It's not too late. So even if you're 17 or you're 55, mm -hmm. there's still room for you in house music. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about how the book's doing and... Um where do, where do you feel that it, it needs to really go right now? Well, it's it's number one. Okay. And um, it hit number one in Amazon. Right. But it's the most important thing. Be having the the showcase at the New York Public Library on June twenty third, and the Newark Public Library on the two, on June twenty fourth. Okay. Um, the Newark Public Library is from six to seven, and then the New Jersey Library is from two to four. Followed by a party with Deuce Martinez, mm -hmm. Naeem Johnson. Um, as well as Ray Vasquez and DJ Dove. And it's important because house music is an American musical institute right. that should always be regarded in the highest regard. So I am actually taking it to the UK uh, from July 10th to the 16th mm -hmm. to also put it out in libraries there, facilities there, so that house music is world, known worldwide mm -hmm. for our achievements and the things that we have done to be recognized for it. And obviously the response and the critical response has been phenomenal. Um, Track Source just gave it five stars. That's great. Um, Library yeah. Journal loves it. Uh, the American Library Association loves it. Mm. So we are getting kudos because it's a different kind of story. Right. It's a unique story about a unique history, about a unique journey. And it's told from the perspective that's inclusive to many scenes that let people know that you are valued. Mm -hmm. And the end of the story is to showcase that the people that are involved in my journey, they are important people in our journey that should also be recognized. Right. And so with that love, through the social justice episode of it, through the arrangement of what DJs have to navigate through, right. this is an important part of American music history. Okay. Well, you know what? It's been a pleasure to have you on my show, man. Um, we could probably do another half an hour of <laughs> yes, this. We can. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Because history just re seems to be reoccurring as we go along. Yes. But it's been a pleasure having you on my show. And this has been another T Low video production. Go out here and get this book. He has a book signing June 23rd at the public library. Um, we'll, we'll forward all the information. We're edited it on the screen. So. This has been another T Lo video production, and your guys stay tuned for another episode. Thank you so much, D DJ Disciple, to be on my show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. Yes. This is our house.